your heart uh, in the midst of everything that is going on in our world. We're just very thankful to be in the land of the living, what the old folks used to call it. The land of the living. Be back again. Woke up this morning. Your right mind. Amen. Activity your limbs. Went about your day and had some struggles here and there, I'm sure. And nevertheless, God kept us to this point in our day. Let's say a word of prayer before we dive in today. Father God, we bless you. We thank you. We love you. It is our pleasure, Father God, to be able to exist one more day and to be existing for your glory. We thank you for your love and your kindness, your tender mercies, your new mercies that we see every day. We thank you, God, for touching the hearts of those that will see this broadcast a little bit later on. And for those that are listening now, we know, God, that you are a very present help. And we're thankful for your presence. We bless you for the indwelling, Father. We thank you for Ruach. We thank you for your spirit dwelling in each of us, believers. And God, you said that, Father, you, we could be able to do anything. There's nothing that's too hard for us, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of what you have invested in us. God, we love you and we bless you. We thank you for keeping us safe down the dangerous highways for those that might be driving or listening while they're driving or perhaps they're riding with someone who's listening. We thank you for getting people safe to their destinations. In the name of Jesus Christ, different shifts that we're working. We love you, God, and we just thank you for giving us a heart, giving somebody out there heart to want to have a listening ear. We bless your name forever because you are worthy to be praised. And we're thankful for all that you are and for all of who you are. We bless your name forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome once again to Brand Light Ministries. Um, here in Emporia, Virginia, where our, um, I have the pleasure of being and serving as the pastor here at Brand Light Ministries. Uh, my name is Andrew Allen. Many of you may know me in these areas, very small areas. Most, most of us know each other. Um, but we're thankful as well for Elder Allen and for Apostle Allen, the founders of Brand Light Ministries, and all of the five fold ministry. A um, very important group of people in any local fold um, has a uh, timeless and just has an a, a insurmountable amount of worth when it comes to the body of Christ and when it comes to us doing the work of the ministry and doing the work that God has for called us to be able to do uh, through the Great Commission. We're very thankful for Fivefold Ministry and all of the elders all over the world, wherever you may be, wherever whatever dominant denomination or whatever church or local fold or, 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 or temple or synagogue wherever you may find yourself convening and assembling with your brothers and sisters we are very thankful for you i am very thankful for you um, i have to say much love and thanks to those of you that are continuing to persevere through these days and through these hours and you have not in any way relinquished or relented from your call and we're very thankful for you uh, showing that strength and that joy of the lord in the midst of uh, it's a very trying time that we are going through and will continue to go through in some ways and fashions or form. But nevertheless, we know that God is here for us. He is our help. He is our shield. He is our buckler. He is our strong tower. It is him that we run in and we find safety. Hallelujah. So we're very thankful for all of you on today. Um, we want to take some time and we're going to discuss the uh, topic that you see there in front of you. No place for replacement theology. No place for replacement theology uh, and um, the scripture for today we're going to look at uh, let's go to we're going to go to Romans chapter 11 today Romans chapter 11 and we're going to reference as we did on Sunday first Corinthians uh, chapter 1 uh, again no place for replacement theology I am again uh, very thankful for all of you who are listening and all of you who are taking to heart God's word. Because how I many you know anytime we hear the word of God, we are supposed to listen. And that word here we know is in the Hebrew is Shema. So we not only are in a place where we can receive the audible sound of a person's voice, but there's the implication of something being done because we hear. So when we hear, we do. Uh, and those two words of hearing and doing are synonymous. Uh, in our biblical culture, in our biblical history, and our biblical Hebrew history, uh, whereas in maybe in, in, in our country in, in today, contemporary time, um, the, the words hear and do are two different things. Have you ever heard somebody say, do you hear me? And you say, yeah, I'm listening. 
But they asked you, did you hear him? Because you didn't do what they asked you to do. And you said, I'm listening, which means you heard it, but you didn't take action. Amen. So um, in, in, in the Hebrew language, that word Shema means to hear. And I, because I hear, I do. So I'm very thankful for those of you that are still hearing. And by implication, you are doing. Amen. We're very thankful for that. And we're blessed um, to have you taking care of that for us uh, as a body of Christ. Um, we, we want to, in a moment, flip to Romans chapter 11. And we want to be able to discuss just a little for a little while and keep my eye on the time. Um, and if you're watching the video later, we're very thankful for you and joining us. Um, and we pray that you have a local church body or a fold or a assembly to which you can find refuge, in, in which you can use, uh, it can be utilized to, for your training, for your edifying, for teaching you the spiritual gifts that God may put inside of you and teach you how to exercise those things. Um, and I think most importantly, having a place where you as a believer or someone who's being drawn to God, perhaps you're not a believer yet, but you're being, you feel, you feel that tug, you feel that pull, and you're being drawn to the Most High Yah. Uh, and perhaps you too, even, uh, I, I'm praying for that you have a place where you will go and you can kind of just kind of uh, discuss the word and hear the word and learn of God's word with your like-minded believers. So um, when we start talking about uh, replacement theology, before we jump to the scripture, um, it is important to understand that there is a divine relationship uh, within biblical history and tradition between what we would call today as the church age uh, or the ecclesia or the ecclesia, which is the body of Christ, the church from the um, New Testament, book of Acts, being born on the day of Pentecost, uh, and, and a divine relationship with uh, our Hebrew brothers and sisters. Uh, and when we talk about the Old Testament, and we talk about some of the influential brothers and sisters who, like the Apostle Paul and the Apostles, who stood on the Torah, who stood on what we know today as Old Testament doctrine. Um, and even though we see our Bible are in two different test or two testaments as, as we refer them as. Um, it's important to understand that, that one is a continuation of the other. That the Torah, the Old Testament, or uh, um, the, the Old Covenant is a, a foundation for the Brit Kadasha or for the New Testament. There is no separation. While in our Bibles we may have chapters, we might have, but there is no division as far as the inspired Word of God goes. And I say all that to understand. For us to, to help us understand that when we're dealing with scripture, um, when we're dealing with uh, biblical history, when we're dealing with church history and Jewish and Hebrew customs and history that are designed and were propelled and put in place by God, these things are timeless. Somebody say timeless. timeless. These things are timeless. They don't have an expiration date. They are not neo or they are not new. Uh, in, in their nature. Uh, these ideas are very ancient, old, and test-timed and proved. And so when we're talking about scripture, while we know that the the the, the testaments that we have, uh, a lot of them, we talk about King James, we talk about 1600s, but remember what was being translated was written thousands of years and hundreds of years before it was put on paper in the form of King James Version. So a lot of times when we're looking at scripture, we just need a, a constant reminder that what you're looking at is the inspired word of God. Many men and women died and were tortured and, and really worked uh, diligently under the power of the Most High God to ensure that what we have here today in the form of a Bible uh, would make it to us today. Amen? Amen. So I, I want us to make sure that we anchor that this is just not a novel. It is not another book. It is not just something we read and perhaps you can pick it up and read it on your free time uh, for pleasure. But please understand, it is the bread of life. Hallelujah. It is the instruction for God's people throughout all of time and eternity. When God gave it to us at the very beginning of time, it, it, it never lost its power. It never lost its effectiveness. Hallelujah. And, and here today, we're sitting here in 2022, and we're still standing on the shoulders of our Hebrew brothers and sisters, our biblical brothers and sisters, Moses, and all of the prophets, and all the people that we read about, these were real people that walked the face of the earth that died and bled and suffered and prayed and, uh, and, and were able to speak life into kings and were able to prophesy uh, things to happen in kingdoms and civilizations. 
And here we are today having that grasp of all of that powerful word in, in the palm of our hands. So we're thankful for that. Now, back to, to replacement theology. Excuse me. Replacement theology is the idea that the uh, ecclesia uh, or the church or the New Testament church has replaced Israel. Um, and this, this is still a very new idea that came about. Um, when, when you hear, uh, sometimes we will take uh, Hebrew scriptures uh, and we were, will teach them as if they were talking specifically to us and they were not talking to someone else first. Amen. Um, you hear that a lot when people want to push Israel aside or they want to push the history of the Bible aside. You might hear people say things like, well, that, that was for then, and that's old, that's out of date, this is for now. We're living in a more contemporary time, and so forth and so on. And, you know, uh, I am the seed of Abraham, which Paul staunchly talked against um, because the promises were to the seed. And Paul made it very clear that he did not say seeds, but seed, plural. And by that, for all of us that are the believers, we fall into Galatians, that we become heirs of the promise of salvation, not the promises of Abraham and Abraham, what God did for Abraham, but the promises of salvation. And by our faith, perhaps we will experience some powerful moves in our lives, and we may be able to obtain things in the way that Abraham did. But a good example of replacement theology is what we talk about uh, when we talk about hyper grace. Um, you know, everything's about grace. I can live in any way, any way I want to because it's about grace. Or when we talk about hyper faith, you know, faith sometimes we remove salvation from faith and it's all about faith to get a house or faith to get that faith those things are true but that that's not the root and grounding and the origin of dealing with faith in scripture it was not about what you could obtain it was more so about who you should come in relationship with and that promise of the extension of the old testament to the new salvation was kind of carried and brought to us through time uh, through the manifestation of yeshua hamashir so that in, that and first and foremost is the greatest promise we can have yes um, God will put us in positions and he will uh, add the blessings to our lives uh, because of uh, our obedience to his word and to him and we'll be able to acquire things. But those are just some quick examples of how replacement theology can show up today. Um, and we'll start talking more so about, you know, prosperity uh, and, and it'll be out of context and, and it'll be more about what we can obtain, what we can do and God wants you to have this and God wants you to have that. Uh, but if we're not careful, we'll leave Israel out because a lot of scriptures that we're reading about for ourselves were written to them first. And so um, I, I, one more thing about replacement theology is, or two more things. One of the thing about, one of the, uh, the two things is, so specifically when you deal with replacement theology, uh, understanding that we stand on the shoulders of our biblical ancestors. Um, their work and their worth in, in scripture and the things that they did the things they were taught what Jesus taught the disciples what, what John taught his disciples what Paul taught those that were under his tutelage those things still are in play today they still make sense today um, and I think the last thing I'll mention about re replacement theology is is kind of where we want to go tonight is when we have a misconception about our or the Gentile believers replacing Israel uh, sometimes that can put us in a position to not have a clear understanding about what's going on in the world. When you think about reading scripture, scripture is talking about things that happen, things that are happening, and things that will happen, right? Especially when you're dealing with prophecy. But if you or the body of Christ has replaced Israel, then what about all the things that God prophesied concerning Israel? Do those things just go away? No. That, that means we... The Gentile church, specifically, has not replaced Israel, all right? There still is a place for Israel. There still is a place for the Hebrew brothers and sisters. Remember Jesus Christ said to Matthew that he was first called to what? The lost tribe of Israel. So even he himself was called to them first. And he said he came later on. He said, I came to my own and what? They did not receive him. He was not received. But they still were not chucked away. They still were not, hope was not taken away from them. They still were not left out in the cold. They just opened the door, according to prophecy, the door was opened because of their ignorance or their lack of, uh, or their lack of belief. Uh, they, they opened the door for Gentile believers to be able to come in relationship with Christ. And when we read first, uh, actually when we read Hebrews 11, that's gonna help explain a lot of that, amen?
So I wanted to walk through that just a little bit so we can have an understanding of, of where we are today. And that last point of when we stand on replacement theology, it really causes confusion as to what we ought to believe today. And that's what we want to focus on uh, tonight, okay? So let's flip to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's flip to Hebrews chapter 11. And while you're flipping there, uh, when we talk about social issues that are happening today, one who has the mentality that Israel has been replaced will also replace Israel and scripture in their mindset or in their thought process. For instance, today there's a lot, there's a lot of talk, honestly, and we, we all see it on the news, there, there are lots of talk about capital punishment. Now, if I am a religious Gentile believer of the 21st century and I do not understand the role of Old Testament scripture or scripture from the Old Covenant or the role of the Hebrew and the Jewish faith and what Revelation says will come to be, what will happen is when it comes to a topic like capital punishment, I won't go back to what God has said about capital punishment because I don't believe those things are relevant anymore. Amen. So now I'm taking what I believe about, or what the, I'm saying I, but let's say the Gentile church or the, the, the new covenant believers. Well, for those that believe in the Messiah, I'm trying to be careful with my, with my language. For those that believe in the Messiah, it will be easy for you to say, okay, so what they talked about about capital punishment in the Old Testament is now irrelevant because that was talking to the Israelites, right? And that's sometimes when we fall short, all right? Another topic that's being talked about today that's, that's a lot going on, you see it on the news, is abortion. If you're operating from a place of uh, replacement theology, you won't even stop and say, what does Torah say about abortion? What does scripture, because you'll say, hey, we're the New Testament church and we've come along to change things. And so everything that God has said to Israel is obsolete because that didn't go for us because we're the church. You see how that that that's, that thinking can cause misconception? Another thing is when we talk about marriage, okay? If you believe you are the New Testament church and all of the old covenant is not uh, is not relevant to you or what God has said about uh, marriage in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament, first century, is not relevant, you'll say, well, oh, we've come along a little bit later and we are the church or we're living in the church age, or we're living in a dispensation of grace, they go hyper grace, hyper grace. Like, so, so because we live in a, disp a dispensation of grace, then it don't matter what I believe about these topics because we are the church. I want to remind us that if that's our thinking, we are in error. We are in error, okay? And we'll talk about a little bit why in just a moment when we read through the scripture. But because as a Bible believer, I have to be, we have to be able to join ourselves with our, our predecessors that came before us, whose shoulders that we now stand on, uh, doctrinally, right, and spiritually, right, that, that impacts our theology or what we think about our God. Amen. I say that for many reasons, as we go and jump in the scripture just a sec, but I want to give us a clear overview and front load where we're going and what we're talking about and how replacement theology if that's our thinking, is going to impact what we think about social issues today. It's going to impact what you think about your life, right? There, I can live in the kind of way I want now, still be saved. That that has a lot to do with replacement theology too, right? I, God didn't require anything of my lifestyle. Well, is that what Scripture says? No, that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that He is very, He He cares very much about how we live our lives, right? But if I'm thinking about, oh, I'm a New Testament church and those things don't apply to me, then I'm going to live a life in error because I'm thinking that I am opposite or separated from what Scripture said. Amen. That makes sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. All right. So as we go to uh, the Scripture today, I just want us to take a look at some dates really quick so to kind of to kind of help prove my point tonight of replacement theology. And then we'll dive into the scripture. I want us to take our time because I know a lot of brothers and sisters that got answers, that, that, that want answers. There are a lot of people out there who um, who have questions, especially now we've been bombarded with 
news and news and media and media. And everybody has something to say. And my, my heart, so, so I just, I want, we want people to know as a Bible believer, we, we should care about what scripture says, right? Because it is the infallible word of God. And in the same way that when someone preaches about a prosperity scripture or a scripture about you coming out and about you, we should feel the same way about when God says, don't do this or don't do that. We should also be joyous about that. So if we, so it, it puts us in a situation to say, are we truly Bible believers or are we after God for what we think he will do for us? And that's, that's a serious dilemma that we, we need to tackle because um, souls are too important. Your minds and your hearts and, and what's going on today in, in time is just too important for us to try to sweep these type of things under the road. Amen? Um, for instance, you know, I get messages and people talk to me, and my concern is that there are some very prominent people who... Um, who are pastors and who are, are very, you know, well known, who are putting things on social media that's not biblical, and that's really concerning. That's that's really concerning for for people like me and you who are true believers who study the word, um, because we're misleading people who truly just want to know what way to go. And the scripture says that he will feed us with knowledge and understanding, right? So we have knowledge and understanding. We're supposed to be sharing that. But if we're speaking from a, a, a replacement theology perspective, in other words, because I'm a pastor, I get to change what scripture says. No, that's the problem. No matter how prominent or I might be or how uh, unknown I might be, nobody may not know you, right? Our, our common ground, our, the constant not the variable, but the constant is the word of God. And so when we go back to 1 uh, Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul talked about how it was important that all the Corinthians say the same things about, you know, circumcision, salvation, uh, prayer, belief in the Most High God, who Jesus Christ is and who he was not, right? It's important that we, so today, it's, it's important that what we believe from a biblical perspective about all the issues that are going on today. So, um, this is another reason why it's important to know them that labor among you because I can tell you I have people in my life and if I'm in error tonight I'll stand corrected and somebody somebody will correct me and I'll come back on the next time we're together and I'll correct whatever it is uh, doctrinally that maybe I misstated or misquoted or whatever the situation may be I think more importantly not a slight of the tongue but more important when doctrine is taught incorrectly uh, and is done so procedurally and to a point where people are taught errors. Amen? And, and I say that because in this day and hour, my, my, my advice to all of us believers is like, really, know them that labor among you. Like, you might follow that very prominent person on social media, but you don't know them. You know, this is not the hour to just be following folks because they who follow them. This is not the hour for that. And biblically, there was never an hour for that. John the Baptist's disciples won't follow behind Jesus' disciples. It was, that, I mean, that's just the way what the Bible structures for us as far as church discipline, we might call it, right? Um, and, and with the expectation for believers. But um, I will caution any of you that it, ask your pastor, your elders, your, your mother, your father, people that you know, ask the, these very important questions that are coming up. Stop chasing down behind people who are prominent and who who got this and got that and they're saying things and based on their posts it don't sound like they know scripture at all but we lead churches but we we are pastors we're evangelists but i don't we don't see evangelism and we don't see scripture coming out of your mouth we're saying things we're not backing it up at all uh that's a problem that's a problem you say well you should say something well that's that's not my place unless they are a false prophet or a lot of false prophet correct or a false teacher, right? More importantly, the structure that scripture provides to us is what? There should be a nucleus of people around that person. That's why it's important for us to know those that labor among us, right? Somebody should be correcting that very prominent person for what they're saying. Um, and that's the problem when we get to a, a certain level and, and nobody nobody is there to hold us accountable. That's the problem, amen? Um, so I would say to you today, please, 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 Please seek out people who you know and trust 
Don't jump behind every bandwagon and skirt tail that you see nowadays because a lot of, a lot of what I have personally read uh, about a lot of the social issues that's going on and people that we would look up to to tell us the truth and to lead us in knowledge and understanding and, and to open up these ideas from a biblical perspective and, and, and to tell us what thus says the Lord. Sometimes we don't get it. We get people's feelings. We get what people think and how people feel. Well, no one's asking you for that. Uh, especially if, if you are uh, a leader in the body of Christ, no one's asking for that. That, that, that you do that on your off time, you do that, you, you know, with your family if that's what you're going to do. But, but to, you know, post something nationally and globally, that's uh, indoctrination of and is error. That that we don't we don't want to to be in that predicament. Let's take a look at these dates really quick, and we're going to read uh, all of a chapter um, because we want to just focus on the fact of what Apostle Paul is saying to these new converts. Now, Pastor what, Andrew, yes, ma'am. you said Hebrews chapter 11? Oh, uh, Romans chapter 11, okay, excuse me. Romans. Yes, ma'am. You said Hebrews. Yes, Romans chapter 11. My apologies. I'm also thinking about uh, Apostle Paul's talking to them about the importance of them assembling together. Uh, but we should be at Romans. Thanks for that correction. Should be at Romans chapter 11. So as you're looking at these dates, I just wanted to, to, to stamp a few uh, dates that would embody the idea that we are standing on the shoulders of our biblical brothers and sisters. Whether you consider yourself to be Hebrew or Jewish, whether you consider yourself to be uh, of the uh, New Testament church, whether you consider yourself to be a particular denomination, please understand we're all one body especially if we all believe in, in Jesus the Christ as the risen Savior, all right? Uh, Messiah ben Yosef and then Messiah ben David, or David, one who's coming back in the, in the same way that Scripture says that he will be coming back, then, then the denominations don't, don't matter in that instant. Like, your church location don't matter. We're all one family under one umbrella, under one theology. Amen? The problem becomes when there are several theologies that we, we're under. We said we're under one roof under one belief, but then you got 12 different doctrines when it comes to a, a particular issue. Uh, so when we look at, just starting at 70 AD, most of us know the destruction of the temple. People died. Um, this is after Jesus Christ, uh, death, burial, resurrection. We People suffer, okay? We move to 140 AD. Those who would begin to call themselves first century Christians were under constant scrutiny. They were under constant uh, uh, persecution uh, and here's what we see what we call today as the Christian church start to walk away from Old Testament doctrine they start to walk away from the teachings of Jesus Christ it became uh, illegal to believe in some of the teachings of Jesus Christ and John the Baptist which was synonymous with John the Baptist was saying what Jesus Christ would have said in those instances but for the same Roman Empire that proclaimed itself to be Christian was persecuting Christians they were persecuting people who believed in the Messiah because to the Roman emperors of that time, Nero being one of which in general uh, would later become an emperor Vaspian or Vespasian would later on be uh, threatened by a god who proclaimed himself over the emperor's power. So the, the true Christians of that time uh, were under lots of scrutiny. Can we fast forward from 140 all the way through the third century, we fast forward to 125, Council of Nicaea, uh, Jewish practices, 325 A.D. All right, Jew, Jewish practices were outlawed at the Council of Nicaea. This is one of the many councils that were held by those in Roman power. Some of them were church fathers put in place by the Roman Empire. Uh, but some of the things and the practices that Jesus had taught them to do, these things became outlawed. And I, again, we're saying this because we need to be able to tell us at what point can we separate ourselves from the Old Testament church? We can't. We shouldn't. We, we shouldn't want to. So this idea of uh, uh, replacement theology and this idea that, you know, we're disconnected from our first century predecessors or we're disconnected from the Hebrews and the Jews of the Old Testament, the, that, that's a fallacy. That, that's not uh, good doctrine at all. 339 became a criminal offense to convert to Judaism or to convert to the ways of the teachings of Christ. All right? In 380 A.D., uh, Jewish practice, look, see how far we're getting away from the truth? See how far we're slowly moving away? Three, 330 A.D., Jewish practice outlawed 
by what was called the church at that time. So now we see there there is a split. And of course, this is Jesus' just snapshot. But there's a split between what Jesus Christ taught and what the Apostle Paul and the disciples who died and who, who, who were persecuted, there was a split between what they taught the proselytes in the, in the first century church to do and what the Roman Empire came up with that should be what we would call Christianity. So there's a split going on here. And this split will continue for centuries to come. Let's fast forward 1144. This, this continued throughout all of the continents of the world. Uh, Christian rules of, uh, of Jewish believers. Uh, so uh, blood libel, things like that came out where if you were a believer in the teachings of Jesus Christ in uh, the 1100s, then there were certain things that were said about you to call rumors. Blood libel was one of those things. If you research blood libel, you'll find out there was a huge rumor about Jews supposedly or followers of Jesus Christ uh, suppos supposedly crucifying Christian children. And, that's, and they began to call it the blood libel. So they were persecuted because there was a murderer at that time and uh, there are certain there are different ideas of why this happened but the whole idea was believers were being persecuted by so-called the christian world because of this this rumor of jewish believers uh crucifying or killing and slaughtering uh little children in 1188 there was a jewish tax imposed a, a special tax on believers of yeshua hamashiach 1218 royal decree to wear a badge, and that's when we see the Megan David come up in a lot of ways, or the Shield of David, um, that six-point star. Uh, they had to, if you were a Jew, you had to wear a star to notify yourself. Um, and again, what, when we see what our predecessors, our brothers and sisters, gone through to get us where we are, we wouldn't want to separate ourselves from them. They were persecuted for believing what we believe today, what we supposed to believe today. So, at what point did, did uh, an apostle or, or a biblical authority say, you know, in the New Testament or in the years to come, you will no longer be required to do what it is that we're doing in the first century. It, d it doesn't exist. You can't find it. You can find where the Roman church decided to separate, and that's what we're seeing here. But you don't find where the, 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 the God-fearers or the followers of the teachers of Jesus Christ, you don't You don't find where they deviate. They don't. That's the reason why they're being persecuted. That's the reason why they're being asked to wear badges on their shirt when they walk around. All right? Um... Let's go 1290 A.D., that's the last one, but of course you can continue to research. You'll see throughout 13, 14, 15, 16, even into the Christian Crusades, you'll see people who are, who are non-believers, who, who are believers in Yeshua HaMashiach, who didn't consider themselves to be Christians, to be converted by the sword. No prophet, no prophet prophesied that should happen. Who did that? Roman powers. Men decided that we were going to do things like that. Had nothing to do with the gospel of the grace of God. Had nothing to do with the Great Commission. Had to do with some very... Uh, wayward people taking the authority of the church into their own hands and doing what they wanted to do. Lastly, lastly, 1290 AD, the king ordered uh, the expulsion of the Jews. King of England, I think, uh, I think it was Charles IV, I can't remember what it was. The king of England ordered the expulsion of the Jews. The Jews were asked to leave uh, and were being pushed out of a continent. So um, those are just some little some, some stopping points to kind of like to educate us on the idea that we are not disconnected. Hallelujah. Nowhere were we commanded to do away with our predecessors and what they went through and what they believed and how they walked and how they lived. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 11. And we have someone here with the message. Lady T has the message just in case we get kind of confused on the cadence of the old English language. King Charles the Fourth in 1290. He was responsible for the Jews being expelled. Expelled. Okay. Now here's the Apostle Paul. If you read Romans chapter 10, I'm just going to read the first three verses. You all stay at 11. Okay. All right. No place for replacement theology. No place for replacement theology. We don't get in 2022. We don't get to make up our own ideas about what God has or has not said. Either we're believing what the Word of God says or we don't, okay? We don't get to make up what we think or how we feel about certain issues. The question is, have we gone back to the Scriptures? Because this has already been put in place. Our, brother, our predecessors have already talked about what a family should look like. If you're a Bible believer, they've already talked about that. We don't have to remake that wheel. 
We've not been commanded to remake that wheel. There's no prophecy that came us that's come across throughout the ages and said, hey, let's redo this. That has not happened. So why are we doing it? Amen? All right, let's go to uh, chapter 10. Oh, actually, you stay at 11, and I'll go to 10. Apostle Paul is talking to Roman converts, believers. Chapter 10, verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire, listen to this very carefully, and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So are we seeing Apostle Paul throw them under the bus? No, we're not. Are we seeing him say that the, the New Testament church or the first century church is going to take their place? Because truth be told, a lot of them were what? They were Jews. They were Hebrews, a lot of them at that time. And right now we're talking about Rome. But at that time, there were also some, some folks that was coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ who were black Jews or who had uh, a Hebrew ethnicity. All right? Verse 10. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. That's some of what we're doing today, right? Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. I read verse 3 again so we can have a kind of a segue into chapter 11. This is Romans chapter 10 verse 3. For they, talking about Israel of that time, a certain group of Israel, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. I submit to you today, we would, some of us, as a, we would fall under that scripture. We have submitted, we have not submitted ourselves to the righteousness of God. When it comes up to abortion, have we submitted ourselves or idea or thoughts about what's being taught about today? When it comes to marriage, when it comes to family, when it comes to taxes, you name it, you name it. Whatever the subject matter might be, the question is, as believers who have, who have a root in Hebrew history, have we stopped and asked ourselves, what does God say about this? Wasn't that one of the purposes for the law? Wasn't that one of the purposes for the law of giving the sign? Wasn't that one of the purposes, right? One of the purposes for us having a record of what the prophet said and when they said it, how they said it, right? So have we stopped and said, what does, as a believer, I would like to know, before I jump on and text anything, before I jump on and share any post, before I like anybody's post, do I stop and say, what does God's word say about this? Now, if you're an unbeliever, I can understand you omitting the whole process because we, I did too. At a point in time, I like where I didn't stop looking at no Bible before. I, I already had my mind what I want to do. But I came to believe it became important to me to want to please God and to live according to his way. So we should be doing that, believers. Uh, pastors out there, we shouldn't just be posting stuff. Elders and members, you shouldn't just be posting stuff. Um, first of all, everybody handle no business teaching. Scripture talk about that too. So so, so you're in error getting on Facebook teaching about Scripture uh, when you don't even study Scripture. Leave that to the rest of us who study scripture. Mm -hmm. Amen. That, that, that's the truth. Because if you're a dentist, I'm not going to bust up in your office and tell you how to do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to school for that. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have no experience in that. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, everybody now, we're a keyboard theologian. And we have a whole lot to say. But then we, we don't ask the people who we expect to know. Amen. That, that, now, that's from the first century, too. So I would understand why we don't follow that structure. Because we believe in... Uh, if we believe in, in replacement theology, then anything they said at that time won't import. We just make up our own systems and procedures name. But for those that are believers, we, we still believe that there's an authority that was passed down to those of us that are believers and for those of us that are put in place according to our gifts in the body of Christ to be the voice of reason. Right? We know in, in New and Old Testament, the elders of the of Israel or the elders of or Sanhedrin in the culture or the elders of the church were like the court system, right? When people needed to know what to do and how to do it, my, my neighbor backed over my cat by mistake with a donkey and mule you know, or a donkey and wagon. What did the law say about if you hurt somebody's animal, what are you supposed to do? The law spells that out. They would go to the elders and sit down before the elders. But nowadays, because we have access to the world, we just say stuff, right? We just do stuff. This is what I think. Who cares what you think? You're supposed to be a Bible believer. Don't stop telling me what you think and tell me what the Word of God said. Now, if you are a believer, that's all you can tell me is what you think, right? 
right? That's all you can tell, you, right? But if you are a believer, or let's say you're an unbeliever who reads the Word of God, you can tell me what the Bible says. You can definitely do that. But if you're an unbeliever who does not care about Scripture, which is what we hear a lot about today, right? Then you can't tell me anything when it comes to Scripture. Just like I can't tell you nothing when it comes to your beliefs. Amen. All right. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 11. Basketball stars are not your pastors. They're not your elders. R&B stars are not your elders. They're not people you get biblical advice from. They don't know. Some of them don't know what they're talking about. Some of them are not devout. Notice I said some. There are some that are. Right. Stop listening to these people that you watch for fun. These people, some of these people entertain us. It's not their job to teach you theology. So why are we listening to them? And then you walk right past the people that you know and you see, and you won't ask them nothing. But you go and preach a whole sermon in error as a keyboard theologian. We better stop playing with God and stop playing with his stuff because he ain't playing with us. Leading people to error, leading people the wrong direction because we're anxious to be heard. Scripture says you should sit in silence. Scripture said there are some people who, who don't need to teach. They themselves need to be taught. Right. Amen? Let's go to Romans 11. Now this is the Bible believers, and for those of y'all that were like us before, you won't call, you can call yourself saved, but you won't even mess with that Bible. Yeah. There's some folks out there now that, that are doing a better job than some of us believers in honoring Scripture. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. They might live a, a, di a different lifestyle, but when it comes to that word, they ain't gonna mess with that. Some of us call ourselves men and women of the cloth. We jacking the word up. Making up our own stuff. Romans chapter 11. All right, let's read through Romans chapter 11. All right. No place for replacement theology. If I say then, have God, I'm sorry, I say then, has God cast away his people? In this context, who is his people? Israel, God forbid, we me let you. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away His people, which He foreknew. What ye not what the Scriptures say of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, verse three. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thy altars and am left alone and seek my life. And they seek my life. Verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? Talking about Elijah, right? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Verse 5. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant. Somebody say remnant. remnant. According to the election of grace, mm -hmm. verse six. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Mm -hmm. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Read that for us in the, in the message, verse six. We can't chuck these people away because if we and when we root and ground us, let's say you call it, you say you're a Christian, you're a New Testament Christian. When you and I root and ground ourselves in the scriptures, we'll find out a lot of the answers that we need. We'll find it right there in the scripture. But because we think we separated, I we we the church. We don't do it like that no more. That's the error. Because when you say you're the church, what you're essentially saying is you are the Roman. You are the age of Catholic Christianity church and not the church that Jesus Christ put in place. No disrespect to my, 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 my Catholic brothers and sisters. But when we look at history, because we have not stopped or no one has not told us and we're just running headstrong a thousand miles per hour, you have to stop and say, you know what? What I believe is more closely resembled to what the reformers were staunchly against, to what Paul was staunchly against, which is the Roman Christianity. The same thing, the same folks, the same systems that were persecuting the followers of Christ 
I find myself on that avenue and I need to jump off that path because I didn't know I was on that path. Now I know. I need to get back on your shoulder path. Now the answers that I was ignoring, I'm going to pay attention to. Because I'm rooted and grounded in what Yeshua had to say, what the prophets had to say, right? Not just what the third century church had to say, or the fourth century, or fifth, or sixth. Amen. Not, not just based on the age of Catholic Christianity, but based on what Yeshua himself said out of his mouth in the gospel. Based on what the Apostle Paul himself is saying right now, we should root really ground ourselves in that. Amen? Amen. Go ahead. Verse, uh, read verse uh, 4 4. No, 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 no. Verse 6. In the message, verse 6. Different translations we can better understand if you're listening. Go ahead. You know, it's broken down. I can do five. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it says, it's the same today. There's a fiercely loyal minority still. Uh -huh. Not many, perhaps, but probably more than you think. Remnant? Uh-huh. They're holding on not because of what they think they're going to get out of it. Come on, somebody. But because they're convinced of God's grace and purpose in choosing them. Is anybody convinced of our grace purpose in are, you, are we convinced? Yes. Bible, belie Bible believers, are we convinced? Yes. Then there's some of us that are on that rat, that path of religion and tradition and religiosity. We're going to jump off that path. We're getting on the path of Christ on verse 5 and 6. All right, keep going. If they were only thinking of their own in intimate self-interest, they oh. would have left alone. Come on. Y'all heard that? These brothers and sisters that were persecuted, if they were only thinking about themselves, they would have quit a long time ago. Nobody them get bored and all just for fun. Come on, y'all. Nobody them get thrown into the Roman Colosseums, get ate up by lions for sport. They didn't do it. These people believed in the word of Jesus Christ. They believed in the word of God. All of it. They didn't say, oh, we don't have to do with the prophets no more because we're the first century church. So we don't listen to the prophets no more. So what gives us the right to say, oh, we're this New Testament church. We don't have to listen to first century church. We don't have to listen to the teachings of Paul no more. That's obsolete. We're going to replace We're going to replace Israel. We're going to replace all of that doctrine with what we think. What gives us the right to do it? We don't have a right to do it, do we? All right. Let's go to verse. Did you finish that? Yes. All right. Let's go to verse 7. Back to King James. What then? Israel have not obtained that which he seeketh for. But the election have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. That's a prophecy right there. Those that think they will see will not see. Those that think they hear will not hear. Y'all remember Jesus Christ talking about that? And he was quoting the prophets when he said it. Verse 8, according as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, here we go, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block and a recompense to them. The place of importance, right? The place that they deem in, in that time, in, in that society, that, that seat of authority. Let that be the very thing that caused you to stumble because that's taking precedent over what I told you, over the gospel of, of, of God. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Listen to this, God forbid, can't throw them out. Can't ignore what they've done and what they've contributed to this thing. But rather, through their fall, here we go, salvation has come unto the Gentile for to provoke them to jealousy. So essentially, for all of the Gentile believers who believe in replacement theology, you're trying to replace the very people who are responsible for you knowing Christ. Y'all heard that? Yeah. For those that consider themselves to be Gentile believers or the New Testament church, when we believe in replacement theology, you are essentially trying to do away with the very people who are responsible for you coming into knowledge of salvation. Because remember, Jesus Christ was called to the house of Israel first. And when the house of Israel, according to the prophets, some of them did not listen, then what was the great commission that was given? Go out. So how dare us be recipients of this great move of God by the gospel of grace. Come on. And now we want to get rid of them. We can't do it. 
We shouldn't do it. Hallelujah. And we're going to find out why in just a minute. All right. Verse 8. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber. I'll read that again. Eyes that they should not see. Y'all got, got my small print today. And ears that they should not hear unto this day. Verse 9. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Verse 10. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. God still got a purpose for his people, don't he? Right. All his people, not just New Testament church. He ain't forgot about Israel. Hallelujah. Israel's still here. We still got a purpose. But rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Who is he talking to right here? Who is this book written to? Jews or Gentiles? Gentile. Gentile. Or to provoke them to jealousy. Verse 12. Now, if the fall, y'all watch this, watch this, y'all pay attention, let's pay attention. Now, if the fall of them, who's them? Jew, Jews. There we go. Jews. If the fall of Israel, if the fall of them be the riches of the word. What's the riches of the word? Because some of them would not listen. The rest of the world got the gospel. You see that? Among many other things. If the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentile. Y'all see that? Is it resonating? Is it connecting? Mm -hmm. How much more their fullness. So, just like today, if their ignorance brought the rest of the world to the knowledge of the truth, as they begin to come back to the Elohim, as they begin to come back to the knowledge of the truth, imagine the things that God will be able to do in the world. Y'all see that? Y'all... All right. Verse 13. For I speak to you who? Gentile. Y'all remember verse 13? Y'all with me? Uh -huh. yes. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke, I may provoke to emulation them that are my flesh and might save some of them. Verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, come on, what did Christ do for the world? Reconcile. How did he reconcile? Right. Come on, y'all. There you go. What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Verse 16, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also what? And if the root be holy, then what? So are the branches. Y'all get that? The lump is Israel, right? Yeah. You see that? First root, so the first root is Israel, right? The lump is who? The rest of the Gentile, right? The root is who? Israel. And then the branches are who? In this instant, right? We're not talking about the parable of Jesus Christ. Here we go. Verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partake of the root, and the fatness of the olive tree boast not against the branches but if thou boast thou bearest not the root but the root thee y'all hear that when we try to replace the old testament scriptures when we try to replace what god himself said in the new testament through his men and women of god when we try to not live like our first century brothers and sisters live we're trying to replace them with a new doctrine and a new church in a new age and it don't exist you're essentially breaking away from the olive tree the the gentiles the lump are saying we no longer need let's say it like this the the branches are saying we don't need the roots no more well how shall you live and that's why we see ourselves dying in some senses right because we're trying to disconnect ourselves Come on, tell God, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Read, read that in the message for us. Break what, it down for us a little bit more. Verse, verse? Uh, uh, 18, 17 and 18. Or he read it again. Uh, verse 17. 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 Verse 
God. God. Mm-hmm. Keep going. If the primary root of the tree is holy, there's bound to be some holy fruit. Mm-hmm. Some of the tree's branches were pruned and you wild olive shoots were grafted in. Hallelujah. Yet the fact that you are now fed by that rich and holy root gives you no cause to crow over the pruned branches. Huh? Huh? Y'all get that? Read that last part again. Because you got to see Israel and you got to see the Gentile believers of the first century who would later lead to some of us. We stand on the shoulders of the Gentile believers of the first, second, and third century, fourth century. We stand on their shoulders. The gospel got to us because of some faithful men and women who carried the gospel throughout the ages. So we don't get to dig them up because when you dig yourself up and the root die, then what else die? I die. We die. The Gentile church dies. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. All right, keep going. Yet the fact that you are now fed by that rich and holy root causes you, you know, gives you no cause to crow over the prune branches. Uh-huh. Remember, you are feeding the root. Huh. The root is feeding you. Huh. So the very thing that we get our biblical and theological and spiritual substance from, if we're not careful, we try to get rid of that. We shouldn't be confused by what the Bible says about the issues of the day. We shouldn't be confused. We, we should not be confused. Go back to the root. Go back to the root. The prophet said, remember the old paths. Blow the trumpet into Tekoa. Make a loud sound. Let folk know, hey, hey, we still here. Warning, warning. You got some evil doctrines coming in, church. I know you're a reverend, you're a pastor, but who's your reverend? Go ask a question before you preach it. I know you're an apostle, but who's your apostle? Who's your apostle, brothers and sisters, that help hold you accountable? I know you're evangelist. Before you go and give that corner message about what you think, go and find out if it's biblical first. Amen. We got a pastor that say that, that watch me grow up. Pastor Powell says it's a, it's a good idea, but is it a God idea? We got a lot of good ideas, but we're finding out some of these good ideas, some of these fuzzy feelings, some of our ways of wanting to advocate are not biblical. It feel good and warm in your tummy. You know what? That's just not right. I'm going to go and get my picket sign. And I'm going down to hit them brakes. Before you get your picket sign, what the scripture say? What the scripture say? I'm telling the believers now, we expect the rest of the world to run with the head like chicken with the head cut off. Anytime something happening all over the place. Some of the stuff that's happening is biblical prophecy. If we weren't trying to operate in, in replacement theology, we would know that it's in there. If we were not trying to get rid of biblical doctrine, if we were not trying to stay away from the Old Testament, we would know the prophet said some of what we see today is going to happen. It's biblical prophecy. It are signs of the end times. But because sometimes we're operating in replacement theology, you will never come across those scriptures. Because I got to keep you jumping. I got to keep you sowing dollars. I gotta keep you, I gotta keep, you know, I gotta keep certain things going on. So we ain't going to this book right here. Because that's gloomy. We're talking about hope need hope. All of this is hope. Every book in here, every scripture in here is hope to a believer. Now, if you're unbelieving, <laughs> you're unbelieving, you'd be like me. I stayed away from the joke here. Stayed away from it. But if you are a believer, it is hope to you. It is life. It is nourishment. It is substance. We don't want to stay away from this. I'll tell you again, evangelists, pastors, five folk, stop telling folk what you think unless what you think is in line with the scriptures and you're thinking it because God said it. Well, I'm human too, but you got the Ruach flowing inside of you, so you just ain't human, baby. You ain't just a normal person walking around. I thought you had power to tread on serpents. Now we got some serpents. Where you at? Where we at? Tread on them sap suckers. Stomp them. Hallelujah. What the power for then? We just go ahead just to walk around and look good? What, what is it for? We don't know which way to go. How, the church not supposed to be blind, my brothers and sisters. We're supposed to know which way to go. Hallelujah. And we do know if we follow this right here. Time out for replacement theology. Time out for saying, oh, that was for them at that time. No, it's for you too. Unless you will disconnect yourself from the group like Paul said. It's for you too. Well, what y'all think about, you know what, let's let's go and see what the scriptures say. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I can't find him. Let's go over here to Brother So and So. He might be. He can't find him. Let's take Brother So and So. Let's go to So and So and say, Somebody gonna find him. The question is, when we find it, do we want to do it? And the answer for believers is what? Yes. Absolutely, yes. We want to please God in every way, fashion, or form. Amen? We want to please God. We're going to start right there tonight at 8.36. For all of y'all that's, that's, that's Bible believers, that's sold out, all them songs we sung pre-COVID, y'all remember them? Mm -hmm. All them songs we sung were getting us ready for now or some of them. <laughs> All them songs we sung about, you know, I cross every river, mountain, I do this. You know, I give myself nobody. away. Can't find nobody. <laughs> you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now we got to live it. We should be living it then, but now you know things change just a little bit for some of us and we got to live it. Amen. And guess what? I know you God fear was gonna do it. Because y'all love the word. Yes, Amen. Our prayer tonight is that we have been accurate. I have been accurate. The Ruach does not miss, does not make mistakes. If there is a mistake or a slight of word, that is me, my my human tongue. Amen. Um, the Ruach does not make mistakes. It calls us to speak accurately. But we, we are thankful for you listening tonight. We're thankful for you to continue coming back because one of the things we hear a lot is, you know, and I mentioned this just a few minutes ago, if you preach on or talk about scriptures like this, even though we know where it's preaching in season, out of season, we, we preach that uh, there's a struggle to do it sometimes, right? But that's what the script, scriptures say. Now, well, we need something that's more refreshing. That That's refreshing. Show me a scripture that's not refreshing. Even the scripture that says that I will scatter you over the face of this world when you disobey my commandments. That's refreshing. Because he says that if you come back to me, humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, I'll heal. So you ain't heal because you won't turn your face and do them. Right? So it's, ref it's still refreshing. Amen? Every scripture from Genesis to Revelation. We just have to change our thinking. We have to change our thinking. Amen. Amen. No place. No place for replacement theology. Regardless of your denomination, my prayer <laughs> for all of us, including me, is that we will stay rooted and anchored, rooted and grounded in the word of God. We will stay rooted and grounded in God and his ways. We will stay rooted and grounded in his scripture. Yes, people are writing new Bibles that are in error. Yes, people are trying to take scriptures and twist them. That's what, they, that's what they're going to do. Amen? But for you and I, we're going to seek God's face. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to do our best to write the divine scripture. We're going to meet people face to face, head to head, toe to toe, with love and with care. When they spitting, throwing stuff and taking the clothes off, whatever it is they do, we're going to sit there and we're going to be in love and kindness or you need to walk away. Don't be that we we should my advice to my brothers and sisters, let's not be fussing on social media. Let's not be threatening folks and walking off the job. You will tell me no, nah, let's not go there. Let's ask God to help us with some temperance. Amen. And let's open the door for some dialogue. Because remember, a lot of our brothers and sisters are hurt. There's a lot going on in this world. As scripture says. Even men will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He said the love of many will wax cold. That's scripture, right? And we see it happen and have seen it happen. I would say to you is be able to give an answer to those for the hope and call that is within you. Be able to have dialogue. Be able to talk. When God opens the door for us to have a conversation with brothers and sisters, let's be able to do that. Amen. Let's be able to have that conversation. But in order to have the conversation, we got to know what the Bible said. So I, 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 I want to challenge all of us to be diligent in our meditation. Be diligent in seeking out the scriptures. Seek out the scripture. When there's a social issue that's happening, or some, there's an uproar, something's going on. Bible believers, we stop and we say what? God. What are you saying to the world? What are you saying 
to the body of Christ. What are you saying to believers? Because your emotions going to listen. You know what I'm? Because we all got it, huh? All of us got it. We got it. <laughs> Thank God for Holy Spirit. Man, you better. Well, this is what I think. It's, it's just, it's, it, it's easy because there's so much contention. And everybody got a lot to say. And everybody trying to advocate for this and that and that and another. Bible believing. Again, we stop. We say, hold up, pump the brakes. I know this is hitting home. It might be affecting me. It might be affecting my mother, my father, my sister, whoever. Let's pump the brakes. And let's see what the Lord is saying. Hallelujah. Father God, we bless you for another night together. We thank you for your time. Your Holy Spirit not only being within us, but your presence being around us and with us. We thank you for your omniscience. We thank you for your preeminence that you are a God who cannot lie, that you are a God who cannot be overpowered. You are a God who has an eternal plan for a temporary earth, for a temporary people, Father. We love you and we bless you. We ask that you give us the words to say that in the wisdom that you've given us, we may win someone to Christ. We may open a door to have a conversation. We may be able to lead one to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you and we ask God that you continue to show us the how to let brotherly love abound throughout the nominations, throughout all of the body of believers, regardless of geographic location. God, we thank you for the fulfilling of scripture of all of us coming together to the full knowledge of Jesus, the risen Savior. We thank you for teaching us how to operate in discipline and in order and structure according to your word, that we may be that bride that you will look for upon your return. God, we love you. We bless you. We thank you. Let everybody say amen. amen. We thank you again. Thank you again. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful remainder of the week. We thank you for your financial contributions. We thank you for your physical contributions. We thank you for your comments. Please, we are open to dialogue. Uh, I'm thankful for all of you who will send an email or who will leave something in the comments that we can revisit. Ask the media team to keep their eyes on that. We open up some dialogue. We need to open up the building and allow folks to come in who want to know more about scripture and what scripture says about particular issues. Um, we, we are open, definitely open for that. It's so easy to walk away from broadcasts and talk about what you don't agree with. What you agree. Don't say it in the sound. Say it in, in the open. Say it in the open. Uh, especially if you really feel like you have a biblical stance to stand on. Say it in the open. And this one other thing too that's been on my heart that, that I, I had a situation and, and just made me think about this. Pastors and advances believers, let's not be out in the open disagreeing with one another. Let us come within and disagree so that when we go out, we'll be on the same page. We'll be saying the same thing. Pa pastors, let's not, and advances, pa I keep saying that because um, uh, we set the tone. Y'all don't, you, you, chicks, you don't, if you don't see me doing it, why are you doing it? You'll see your pastor doing it, why are you doing it? You'll see your elders of your church saying that they're doing it, why are you saying it? Right? Why? Why? And if you're not, again, this is for believers. Right? So let's let's not go out in the street and let everybody see that we disagree on certain things or we we falling out. Right? Let's let's come inside, um, according to what Apostle Paul taught, and go and get that one and have a conversation with them. If that one doesn't want to listen, bring that one in you. And let's come in together to your elders within your local your local church and have a conversation. Let's work that thing out. Let's reason together. Amen. And what scripture said, let us reason together. So very thankful for you. Uh, on that note, uh, we want to say shalom to you, shalom to you, and shalom to you. Please have a wonderful night. We love you. We thank God for you. Shalom.